Um, but I think that people give themselves these permissions. Like you go and, you know, they'll just grab the, the hospitality, the bottle of tequila and just serve themselves a drink. And, and it's just like, uh, would you go into somebody's house and just open their refrigerator? You wouldn't, right? You wouldn't, I wouldn't just show up at your house. Of course you, know, not. you wouldn't dare, you wouldn't dare walk in someone's house and open the fridge and say, Oh, check what you have. Oh, I'm gonna have a little did, bit. Did you imagine, Lenny, if I just drove up into your house? See, you just, could. See now, I would be okay with that. But you would laugh. You would, would laugh. Like, yeah, us, yeah, we would laugh about that because we yeah. know. But if it's somebody we don't know and you open my fridge, I'll did you imagine if I just went into your house and like made myself a tuna fish sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> David would have done something like, bitch, where's your mayonnaise? <laughs> yes. You got some onions. But, you know. And then, tell you, and then say to you, your tuna fish is dry. Yes. See, the, the, see, we're used to that. I'm used to that with the core, the yeah. core people. But right. if it's someone who's not, like you said, if it's someone that's not part of the core, you have to ask. You have to ask, and you also have to say to yourself. What if you, you have a doubt in your mind right. that you should reach into that bucket and grab a drink, then that means don't grab Don't it. you dare. Yes. And I'll tell you who's the most, uh, the roughest to play that role with. You'd never touch Dave Morales' bucket. No. I've seen him read people in his booth. Oh, yeah. God. Well, you know, it, it's, I don't blame him in a way. You know, David is very forward, you know, and. It's definitely yes. oh, you know, he's very forward. <laughs> I've seen him curse people out. Yeah, he's not going to mince words for sure. But, you know, I think that, you know, it, 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 there's an etiquette, right? You don't tap the DJ when he's got the headphone in his ear and he has his hands on the mixer. Wait a second. Wait <sighs> a second. Try to catch their attention from the side, you know. Uh, don't jump in front of the booth, grab, you know, stand on the table. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's just... You would think common sense. You would think that people have common sense. And I find that people do not have common sense. They don't have common sense for, you know, it, it, it to me, um, I think a DJ appreciates you more if they see you right on the dance floor in front of them dancing. You know, and you can say hello if you feel, if you're in that inner circle. You know, um, you know, uh, the same with you know. I have to now. I have to talk about comps now. Go ahead. You know, I extend comps pretty frequently, um, and especially if somebody calls me and says. I'm having a hard month or I don't have that, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit in a tight spot. I, I look at it two ways. Everybody goes through their ups and downs. So you give a person a comp, you know. The other way I look at it is if you're having such a hard time, maybe you should be working on a resume and not at the club every single night or every weekend. So I look at it two ways because you can, sometimes you, you know, it's, it's, there's repeat, let's call them repeat offenders. I've seen you wrote, I've seen you, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've seen you write this down on a post one time. It's like, when you got angry about something with this, you were clear on this. I'm it's like, yeah, people are just, job. Stop. they have no shame. They have no shame. And they'll get a comp and ask for a drink ticket. And once or twice, I've been asked for train fare to go home. No. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. So wait, they got comped, they got drink, and they need to get home. Mm -hmm. And you need to get a job. And my attitude is... You can't get home. What the hell are you doing here? Like, exactly. But but it exists. And you know what? It's okay. I give... I You know, you kind of... 
because people go to the club for many different reasons. I said that before. Sometimes you go to the club to be with people. You're lonely. You need, you know, it's that's real too. But there's repeat offenders. And you get to know them after working in the business for so long. Oh, yes. And you just kind of like, just stop. Like, you know, I don't care if people are offended. You know, it's like, you know, there is, you know, there, there are boundaries. There's a respect level, right? You would not go into, like, for instance, you wouldn't go to the movie theater and walk up to the snack counter and go, can I have that popcorn? Uh, that's five dollars, sir. Yeah, I don't want to pay for it. Uh, excuse right. me, sir. That's five dollars. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Nah, nah, I think you should give it to me. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you, Coca Cola too. <laughs> yeah. But, sir, why should I get? Nah, because I'm here. I'm, I'm cool. I'm at the movies. You know, like I'm. A, I think you should give me that. And and it's just the reasoning behind it. Um, you know. And, and and working at a club for so many years, like with Nicholas Matar, who, in my opinion, one of the best club owners ever, you know, um, you know, I learned, I learned a lot. You know, he gave me the keys to his clubs. I learned, you know, people don't realize what, you know, the rent for these venues are, the insurance that these owners pay. The staff costs, the security, the the liquor bills, the the um, you know the employee you know costs, and and then people get and then they get sued all the time. You know, somebody will come in drunk, you know, fall on the floor, you know, something will break or sprain an ankle or. Lose a tooth, and then they want to sue because they were drunk and they fell. You know, it, so people, the general public doesn't understand that it is a business, and you know, the margins in the club business, they're not what people think. You know, you you could have a hit club and make a lot of money for a while, but but club. You know, they also have their their life, you know, their lifespans, right? Yeah. And, you know, and you know, there's clubs like, you know, I was just in Ibiza and I went to high for the Martinez brothers. I was like, wow. First of all, it was beyond. I, I'm so proud of them, those those guys, you know, because I've seen them. I I was one of the first people. Not the first, but one of the first to book them in New York. And I, I've stayed very tight with the father, Steve Sr. We're very good friends. And, you know, and Maggie and their whole family. So, and I know Steve's story, Steve Sr. And I've seen, I've seen these boys and how they've, I'm so, we should all be proud of them, right? Yeah. They're from New York. You know, they're, you know. You know, Latinos, Puerto Ricans, I am beyond over the moon with them, you know, because, and they work hard, right? You know, that that DJ life is not what people think it is either, right? It's a lot of traveling. That traveling, you know, Danny Tenegli always says, they don't pay me to the, pl- they don't pay me to play. They pay me to get there. You know, because it's a grind. If you're one of those DJs that's constantly touring, you know, that air, well, constant airplanes, you know, uh, running from airport to airport, airport food, plane food, hotel food, you know, it's just not healthy. No. It's, it's not healthy. You know, I know a lot of guys in the business that are touring DJs that have health issues, even young ones, because it's just not a healthy lifestyle, you know? Um, so they sacrifice a lot. But anyway, I've seen, I went to high. I was over the moon. That club, now that, getting back to my point about some clubs make 
that place was like, I couldn't believe how busy it was. Like I hadn't seen something like that in a really, really long time. And I was happy that it was their party. When I was there, they were playing with Marco Carolla. And it was an amazing, amazing um, experience just to see, you know, I found a little corner. It was so packed that I didn't even get to the other room because it was just such an experience, right? That I found a little corner and I just watched them and the crowd. And, and I love to watch them because they're so fearless when they play. It's almost like they're so relaxed, you know, on, on, the, on the mixer. On, it, they're like flowing. And it was, it was a great experience, you know. And, um, and I, I also went to, um, this was just like a month ago, I went to Pasha and I saw uh, Henrik Schwartz. Ever see him play? Yes. I was in awe. No mixer, just kind of like a live set, you know? Yeah, it's like playing almost like a band, but he's doing it himself. He's got everything there. He's doing, he's baking the beats. and. But it sounds better, you know, a lot of his tracks, but it sounded better than the tracks. I could not, I was just like in awe of him, you know? Um, and those clubs in Ibiza, they're, they're, you know, they're seasonal, but they're gold mines, you know, they're, you know, all of Europe flocks to those places, you know? Um, so, but going, getting back to my point and the comps, you know, I think you see it in New York, especially, you know, people have this sort of attitude of self entitlement kind of, mm. you know, like I, I, I always go to a club, especially if I go to a club, I may have one person with me, if even that. And if I have a friend there or something, I make arrangements, bef- try to make arrangements before I get there. I also don't like to show up without being announced, kind of, you know, because people are busy, right? It takes time for you to text somebody to have them run to the list person to get their names on. You know, there's, there's more involved when people text you from the front of the door. <laughs> And they go, I'm outside. I'm like, so? <laughs> Remember that, everybody. Be careful. If I'm like, I'm outside. So what? What do you want me to do? I'm gonna come what do you want me to do? Like, you know, it's like there's other people outside, too. It's like unless it's like a DJ that I have to go out and get. You know, and then if you go outside, Benny, can you, you know, no. No. <laughs> Especially if I'm at a cl- you know, if I'm at a club where I'm working at the club, then I can probably help somebody out if I want to. If I'm at a club where I'm just like having a party, you know, there's a whole system, right? They have security people. They have people checking IDs. Don't run up to the front and bypass all of that and go, you know, if especially if I got you on the damn list. Like, figure it out. Like, you want me to walk you in too? It's too much, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, it's like, it's like, let's do the reenactment, ready? Benny, 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 you're like, and I, and then I, I yelled at my friend recently because, you know, because he should know better. He's my good friend. How dare you? He was like, go outside. This, this, this girl's outside. I'm like, why are you doing this? I said, if you, if I go outside, that means, 20 other people want to get walked in. 20 other people want comps. You know, you know, so it's like you can't hang out by the door. You know? So it, there's just all kinds of stuff that happens, you know, that I don't think people are aware of that it's, it's, um, it, it, there's so many little things going on, you know, and then you got a million. You know, the DJ's texting you, oh, I have no water in the booth. <laughs> you know, um, you know, somebody else is texting you, I need change. You know, I don't have change. We run out of tickets. Um, is the air, is the air conditioning on? <laughs> yeah, a simple I don't know. Is it on? I think it is. You know, <laughs> have these clubs, 
you know, they have shitty air conditioning. By the way, I went to Germany. I was just in Berlin, too. Oh my God. There's no air conditioning in the fucking clubs. None. There was no air conditioning in the garage. No, there wasn't. Right. There was fans. I tell this all the time. There was no AC. No air conditioning in garage. But people seem to forget that. I go, in the middle of the summer, it was hot. But And then the old school kids tell you, oh, I know. I know that game. They're keeping the air conditioner off so people buy drinks. It's That's like, true. Back in the old days, they did. But not... Yes, it's true. It, and I'm the first to say it, but we know the air conditions in some of these places is hands down. We know. I mean, I remember, you know, you know, a place it was a like, game. It was a game. You know, like Cielo and Output. Nicholas would spend so much money on keeping those air conditioners, um, you know, working. And sometimes they break. Yeah, you can't help it. It happens. They freeze. Or sometimes, you know, what happens too is, no room, you know, the way that clubs get packed, the air conditioning cannot handle the amount, the amount of hot air and humidity in the room. When the room gets, the rooms aren't meant to be that packed, you know? And so they get really full and people, you know, people complain, but that's, you know, that's, that's huh. I'm cold. I'm hot. I'm cold. I'm, the drinks are so expensive. Well, that's a big thing. That's that's everybody complaining about that. The drinks are really expensive now. Wherever you go, it's oh, just God, it's gotten crazy now. It's, it's crazy. just the, the sign the sign of the times. But but I think I should I should I talk about like a little bit of I got some of the did I get some of the um, complaints out of the way? Yeah, you got all the complaints out. And they're all being quiet. And all the children are saying, oh, we can't bother him anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, come on. I don't want to not be approachable either. Um, don't bother Benny. Let Benny but, be you. But, but, you know, like, but it's not just me. It's also the DJs. The DJs are playing and their phones are being blown up by people trying to get in the club. If you're don't bother the DJ. They're playing. Unless you're like the sister or the, the aunt or the, you know, or in the top. Like my best friend and me know he's my best friend. He knows he can text me. But, you know, it's like enough. But anyway, what else do you want to know? Okay, so here we go, everyone. I've been waiting to ask the question. So he gave us all the stuff that he's dealing with today. So let's go back in time a little bit. So take us back to a time when this thing happens, where you find this music. How does it begin? How does Benny Soto find this music or the music find you? Well, it really, you know, I was born in the South Bronx. <clears throat> when it was burning and when Son of Sam was around shooting people, that's, that's, that's kind of, you know, what I remember about growing up on 149th Street and Tintin Avenue, which was around Prospect, around Southern Boulevard, you know, a lot of heroin, a lot of junkies, a lot of gangs, a lot of crime, birthplace of hip hop, right? So I, I grew up hearing the, you know, the sound of salsa in the street and the echoes of hip hop, you know? I, we could hear it from far away. You know, you would hear that, you know, you know, the they would use the echoes on the raps. You know, it was like simple back then. You know, you would hear, you know, to the beat, y'all, 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 y'all. You know. It sounded like really far away, but it was in the, in the schoolyards, you know, in the summer. And the conga players in St. Mary's Park. And that's what, that's how I grew up, you know. Um, and it was a rough neighborhood. And there was a sense of, even when I was a young kid, like I had to get out. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I had to get, do it somehow, you know. And music was the way I got out. You know, I heard, you know, it, it, at the beginning, you know, I remember going to little house parties where they were playing like disco and I heard some music that I had never heard before. And, 
And um, I remember going to a house party and there was a couple hustle dancing and they were they were dancing to uh, Coco Motion. Remember that? And they were, that was like a hustle record, right? We do it good. Yeah. And they were, we were sitting on and they were hustling in the middle of the living room. And then I remember going to another party on Grand Concourse and watching a kid break dancing on his head in the middle of the living room. You know? And so I grew up seeing this, you know, and, and, and being exposed to music, mostly salsa and wasn't called R&B then, soul, right? Stephanie Mills back then, you know, um, and other people, you know, uh, Tina Marie, you know, it was more, um, I wasn't exposed to club music yet until I started going downtown, right? From And if that's what you called it when you were living in the Bronx, where were you going? You were going to the village or you were going downtown. And that meant you were going to the clubs, you know? And, um, you know, my early club memories were, you know, like Bonds, you know, going to Bonds. Bonds was like going to like, you know, a mega club back then. And it was a mega club, right? It was massive. Massive. And the, the big inflatables that would come down from the ceiling and fill up, you know, you still don't see that t- anything that grand today. You know, that was pretty grand, even by today's standards, you know? Very much so. Yeah. And that grand staircase, you know, going up and, um, and then there was uh, other, like, more like little dives that I would go to that was like um, Gotham's and, you know, um, they would have all the drink specials. And, you know, um, you would start, that's where I first started to, to hear music that I was like, wow, you know, I can't get this on the radio. Because I was listening, you know, to KTU, you know, on the stoop with my friends, you know. And uh, there was, I was in, I was in high school. I think I was a junior or senior. And there was a a, a, a friend of mine his, in school. His name is Craig Willie. I'll never forget. And I was talking about some clubs and, and he marched into the office and was very grand and basically said, no, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. The Paradise Garage is the best club. And I was like, no, but he was like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Paradise Garage is the best clubs. It has the best sound and the best light. And the best music, period. And I was just like, who is you, bitch? (laughs) But, But he was really right, you know, and it was soon after that, that I had a friend that was celebrating a birthday. And I think we went to a club on Union Square that was called, it wasn't the Underground. I think we tried to get into the Underground that night and didn't. Um, I think it was Fresh 14. There was a club called, it was a dive place. And anyway, we ended up walking from Union Square. Maybe it was two, two different times. One time I went to the garage, and it was the first time that I ever went. And I, I went outside to the door, and, and we didn't get it. The second time was my friend's birthday, and he said, we, was, we were scheduled to go somewhere. And he said, no, no, it's my birthday, and I want to go to the garage. So we knew a, we had a friend that could get us in and we were young. We were just like, you know, we still had, I, I had a curfew. I had to be home at certain time. And it was like four o'clock in the morning. We were standing in front of the garage waiting for this person to show up that had a membership that was going to get us in. And so this person showed up. I was supposed to be home already. Meanwhile, I was standing outside trying to get in. And so I got in. 
And Noel gave us a hard time. He was, he was like, I'm going to let you in this one time. He said, he did say this. I'll never forget it. He said, enjoy it. It's the first and the last time. And I was like, whoa, you know, but I, I, I never forgot going up the ramp, you know, seeing the, the, the sign, making that turn into that coat check area, turning into the, uh, in, you know, that other vestibule where you walk into the main room. It was, you know, it's not over was playing. I, I'll, I remember it like it was yesterday. It's not over was playing first choice. The music was synchronized to the lighting, you know, the circles with the pin spots. And I stood there on the edge of the dance floor and I thought, what the fuck is this? That's what everybody said. That's the first, when you go the first time, what in God's name is this? <laughs> Yes. You say when you walked in there, that's exactly, everybody says that exact same thing. And I, and I had a distinct feeling. It was like, mm, like I'm home. Like I barely went anywhere else after that, you know? Um, and I caught the, the tail end. What a lot of people say is, was the tail end of the garage. A mm -hmm. lot of people say it was, you know, you'll have the garage purists. You'll say, Oh, those weren't even the good years. Right. <laughs> yeah. You hear that all the time. You hear that all the time. They you. were good enough for me. Thank God I got to see it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to talk about any of it. <laughs> right. And 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 it it from the moment I walked in there, I was in awe of how it all worked. You know, these the speakers, the lighting, it's like everything was just, you know, you could tell that there was a lot of care that went into it. The experience, you know, the the lighting changed. It wasn't always the same. They would change it. You know, they looked after the sound system. You know, the sound system was an experience. Just I had never heard sound like, that, you know, um, on that scale and that level, and that quality. I, you know, I still remember. You know, Larry would put the needle on the record, and you could hear the crackling clearly. You know, of of you know needle being put down it was um it was very special and then the energy of the club the energy was beyond you know anything you know you you could experience you know it was uh it was very tribal it felt like totally otherworldly right and i didn't get into the booth right away um, I didn't know anybody. I was just a young kid who happened to just go there because it was his friend's birthday. And, and it was, it was life changing, you know, because it, it also opened my mind up, right? We're talking about music and how, how that, you know, it also, opened my mind to like hearing new sounds, right? Because Larry was so eclectic in a way. Um, you know, there was some weeks where he played the same stuff. And then there was some weeks where he was like all over the place and played such interesting stuff that you would think like, you know, like he would not, who would play that? He did. He would. He wasn't the best in my opinion. Now that, you know, if I compare him to, some of the guys that can really, you know, it was different. He was also mixing on those Thorins and it was, it was a different thing. I, I wouldn't say he was technically the best that I've heard. Right. Um, but he was in only my humble opinion and how I experienced, this is only my experience. You know, the garage was, the sound system was his instrument. That was an instrument. You know, um, you know, Larry had a lot of control over it, the way that it was set up, the volume, the crossovers, you know, the lighting, you know, he still operates some of the lighting himself. So it was an instrument that he used to get his message across. And that system 
never replicated again, but it was a very special instrument. It was one of a kind. And I believe that that was a lot of Larry's success. I don't, not that I, I, you know, I also heard him mix very well as well. So I'm not saying he was a bad mixer, but technically speaking, I don't think I've heard better. But what Larry was unfailable at was he could read the room, you know, and he could change the mood in the room in a heartbeat. You know, I've heard a lot of people that went to the garage say, oh, well, he didn't, you know, why didn't he, he always played the same things. He always, you know what? Yeah, he did a lot, but he also, in my experience, what he did for me as a young person was, you know, I heard him play like rock and like sort of like, you know, Italo disco, you know, like sounds that I was, that I had never heard played on that sound system did something to my brain. It was like, I wasn't, I was no longer stuck where I was musically. I was like, wow, like I can listen to this. And, you know, like Larry would play like Phil Collins and he would play Pat Benatar. He would play, you know, as well as like Ain't No Mountain High Enough, you know, like, which, you know, by the way, if I never hear that record again, I'll be, I'll be okay. It's not taking anything away from Jocelyn. Wait, will you be okay? I won't be. I'll be fine if I never hear it again. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a great record, you know. No, it, we know. We know what you mean. It's too much of a staple. I get it. I, we get it. I get it. So, you know. So I learned, I learned a lot. And then I, I, I got, I got to know Larry just a little bit. I was very afraid of him. First of all, I was like, a, you know, young 19, 18, 19 year old kid standing next to God. You know, Larry appeared to me like he was like a, a superhero. And for me to get into the booth and just stand next to him, I was afraid he was going to look at me. I just wanted, I would just go and stand there and not move for a, a minute or two. And then, because I was afraid of him, I was in awe of him, you know? I never saw somebody command a dance floor like that. And um, so when I got into the booth, well, first, David DePino threw me out of the booth many times. You know, and remember when you would go up to the, up to the booth, it was like going up the stairs. So then there was a little door up there and you would either be let in or not. So, you know, I often took the walk of shame, which was going up and then having to coming come back, back down. Back down. <laughs> right? Because I wasn't admitted into the into heaven right away. Into the sanctuary. No. David, and I love David. He's one of my favorite people. He's so funny, but he got rid of me a few times security security he said no no <laughs> and it wasn't until i kind of um started working for keith Haring that i kind of got admitted into the inner circle mm. um and then you know i kind of hung out in the booth and 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 got to know larry just a little bit i'm not gonna say i was his close friend um he knew me. We knew each other. He said hello. Um, I knew everybody, um, I would say, superficially. I wasn't, like, really tight with many people. You know, Keith, I was, you know. Um, but that experience of being in the booth and, 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 you know, Larry had that phone in the booth, right? And... I think I had to call once because I had more than one guest. So I had to call to get it okay. And so, so you know, I had to call. And he picked up the phone. I was terrified. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, he's going to say no, you know. He's say no, no way. 
But, you know, I got my comp card from him. He gave it to me. It wasn't because I was so cool or because I was, you know, I got it because I was working for Keith. That's right. And he gave it to me. And I remember getting that card with the C, you know, it had a CC on it. And walking out of the club when I got that card, you could not tell me that I had not arrived. I was practically flying with that card. And, you know, it was uh, uh, such. Oh, it. It's the best club in, the, uh, in New York City. It's like the best premier place to be. How could you not feel that feeling? I was like, what so- the fuck? Like, Imagine- and my mother could not take it. She was like, I know you downtown and that got our head and I don't give a fuck. I don't. You know, she was pissed. She was like, I know what goes on there. You know, it was like. You didn't know what was going on there. Yes. None of our parents knew what was going on. No, there. no, no, no. Are you crazy? That shit was extra. I kept yeah. that quiet. Everybody kept that quiet. Hell yeah. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Able to say, I can never tell your mother. I said, <laughs> a mother, I'll be dead. Yes. So it was, you know, there was a lot of, you know, that whole experience. I was sort of ushered into a, a like the art world, fashion world. You know, I was around a lot of people, Andy Warhol, Basquiat, you know, I knew all those people, you know, and and but it wasn't, it was totally by accident. And it happened. I was just going to ask you, was that a luck thing that happened? Was it lucky? Or did just something that just was like fire, like discovering fire? Like what really? It was, it was, I was at the right place at the right time. It was, um, I saw people wearing Keith Haring t-shirts. Okay. And at the, at the garage and I, and you know, I wanted to know the, those symbols were so like iconic and they just popped. And I was just like, what is this? I, it felt like a private club, you know, and somebody told me, you know, oh, he's an artist and you, sh- you sh- here's a, you know, here's a pin. You should go to one of the shows. And that's how I met him. And, and he was going away on vacation. He was between, he was very trusting by the way, but he was uh, between assistants and he, you know, I ended up, you know, with the keys to his studio at, you know, 18, 19 years old. And I was, uh, you know, I think back then I was making probably like, for me, it was a lot of money, like 300 bucks, you know, a week. And I was, and I had, you know, access to the inner sanctuary. And yeah, it's a lot of money at that age. And I was just like, I had arrived, you know, and I felt good. You know, I felt grand, you know, listen, I had a lot of issues after that. That I, that I had to deal with as a young person, but um. But would you ever trade that experience? No, no. I wish I would have done a few things differently. So uh, there's some regrets, though, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. It was an experience that changed me so profoundly, but almost killed me. You know, um. It was not an easy place to navigate as a young person that didn't have a lot of um, sort of um, guidance, right? My parents were first-generation immigrants from Puerto Rico. They're going to know about that. What are they going to know about that shit? They don't know know anything about that stuff. And and I was thrust into that And and had to fend for myself. You know, I always tell everybody that whole experience is is basically baptism with fire. Exactly. I don't know how else to put it. That is what that whole experience. You are now just went from the Bronx, which was rough in its own right, living in that situation, to a whole different, glamorous, rough situation. Yeah, yeah. And I used to... I say glamorous because it was, but then it wasn't. It was. A, it had a very dark underbelly. Oh, my God. It was um, so dark. And, you know, and I, I traveled with Keith to Europe and, and you know, I was in Paris. I was in Amsterdam for some of his one men. You know, I was like, all of a sudden, 
jet setting and and uh you know meeting people like Grace Jones and Boy George and Brooke Shields. I mean, I was in it, you know, and that's why Grace is behind me. Actually, she's behind me because me and her share the same birthday. Oh. May 19th. So um it was it was uh what I always say, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Because I had to figure out my footing pretty quickly. You know, and 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 you know, I I I I came out of that experience pretty unscathed, considering, right? And and you know, the garage, in my opinion, ended very tragically. You know, it was it closed for whatever reason it was going on with the lease or whatever. But you know, you think about it, almost everybody died. I know. Me and Kenny Carpenter talk about that all the time. Almost it was, like it was a curse on the whole club and everything. It was a curse. You know, I have some, I've had dreams. This yes, is so sir. weird. I've had dreams where I'm at the garage again and I'm walking through the club and it's empty. And I'm, and I'm like looking for everybody. I'm like, where is everybody? You know, it was a traumatic experience. The AIDS epidemic killed everybody. I would say, I don't know what the percentage is, but I would say, oh, more than half. More, more like 75 to 80 percent, including the other club too, the Saint, which is the alter ego. Most yeah. of the of the patrons were dead. Yeah. So it was a it was a Mo- not everyone, most I said. Please. Yeah. yeah. And then I got my life together a little bit. I kind of had a little bit more of a direction and 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 then a lot of people were dying even then. And it was, uh, you know, I stayed out of clubs for for a long time because I needed to get my head on straight and I needed to figure myself out. And and um, clubs was not the priority. The priority at that point in my life was my health, my my mental health. You know, was was more important than than uh, anything. And I started to go out. Very, very slowly, you know, um, because I was, I didn't want to repeat stuff, you know, and there was a friend of mine who was working at six Hubert street when it was vinyl and he got very, very sick. He, he, he's still alive, but he got some kind of brain cancer and he thought he was a goner, but yeah, he made it. He's still living. God bless and Thanks so he used to be like the day manager there. And it was at that point, the shelter was not the the tent. He had a party in the building, but it was this guy, Nick Di Tommaso was the owner. Um, and the club had been through a lot of problems. It had lost its liquor license. That's right. I think there was a shooting there. Um and I came on because my friend got sick and the owner called him up and said, well, what do I do? You're not here. Who am I going to get to do this? I don't trust anybody. And my friend said, you should hire Benny. He comes to the club and you should hire him. And he called me and he did. And I used to sit in the hallway, the long hallway, yep. and move to the phone during the weekdays. And, and, I would go to the bank. I would accept, you know, there was no liquor license. So, you know, they would do the water and Gatorade delivery. And and there was no money there really because the club had no alcohol. So I kind of made jobs up for myself. So I would like decorate and I charge this one, you know, a couple hundred dollars for that. And then I'd do the cashier and I'd charge a couple hundred dollars for that. And then during the week I'd be there. So it would add up to something at the end of the week. But there was really no money at the club. And I was in school. I was still in college. And I was trying to figure it out. And um, it's kind of where I met. Not the first time. That's kind of where I met Rob Fernandez. 
in Rob Fernandez was probably the biggest mentor I had in terms of um, promotions and becoming, you know, a promoter. Because he really was the one that really helped me, you know. He was very difficult. He was not an easy person at, in the least bit. He was rough. But he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot. He used to say to me, we would have a, a party where we would make good money. And then he would say, I would be like in my glory, you know, with my money. And he would say, I don't know what you're so happy about. And I would say, what do you mean? We just killed it. We're doing good. And then he would, he would, whenever he, he would say it in that pitch, with, he would start the sentence like this. I knew I was in trouble. He would go, Benny Soto. Yes. <laughs> Listen to me. All that money you made, you're going to have to give it right back next week. Because what have you done for next week's party? And then I would go, well, it's next week. I'm, he would say, this party's already over. It's happening. What are you planning to do for next week? Because as far as I know, he would say, that party's looking like a big clunker. Nobody's going to come. And you're going to have to fucking spend all the money you made. So he taught me that. You know, he taught me that. Like, you know, it's, it's you have to look ahead. And you can't get stuck on one part. Sometimes you do lose money. But you, you keep it moving, right? And all those valuable lessons that, that, that he taught. You know, the first, some of the first big parties I did. I mean, Roger Sanchez was one of the first parties I did with Rob. There was this other party that we did with Steve Travolta. That was one of the first parties we did. I booked DJ Harvey as, as a a promoter independently. That was one of my first bookings independently. And I was in college and I was so poor that I had no money, right? His fee was a thousand dollars. He's much, 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 much more now, right? Back then he wasn't playing that often. And these kids convinced me that he was a great DJ, which he is. He's one of my favorites still. And they said, you should book DJ Harvey. There was a place called Table 50. It was a little club on Broadway downstairs. So I booked Harvey. It cost me $1,000. And I had to pay the fee. And I had to pay the plane ticket. I had to get a plane ticket. So I had no money. This, but literally, the $1,000 was all the money I had in my whole life. So it's funny because his wife will still joke with me today because she said to me, do you remember you sent me a money order for $1,000? And I thought, I, I had forgotten that. So I remember Harvey came. I sat at the front, people coming in to pay, and literally waited till the last person walked in that night and he blew me away by the way his set was so amazing um and the per the last person that walked in i literally covered all my expenses and i was shaking in my boots because i had no money to eat i had no money to pay my rent but meanwhile i was giving <laughs> djs my last bit of money you know and and that's how i learned you know it's like I started to learn how to how to look at the numbers, how to make things make sense. Sure. You know? um, because it's 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 really a business. You know, you have spreadsheets and you look at everything and how what things come in, what things go out. You know, you have to figure out what you're gonna charge. If this you're paying this out, then what's your tickets? You know, it's it's simple, but what's not easy is you know, you get a gut for it, right? After a while. Like, I know now. I can just look at something, you know, and I get offered a lot of acts. And now that I'm older, um, I'm a little pickier, you know? I want to do what I want to do. Um, but I kind of have a sense for what I, 
you know, and a lot of people say, oh, well, Benny, you always do the same acts. Well, you know what? I've grown with the same acts over the years and we've grown together. So why not do what feels good and feels, you know, um, you know, I've grown with a lot of these guys, you know, um, with, you know, Louis Vega, Danny Teneglia, Danny Crivet, you know, Francois, you know, like, you know, so many that have watched me and have given me the opportunity. I'm forever grateful. You know, Danny Crivet was the guy that put in my head one day he, I was walking around six Hubert street and I stopped to talk to him for a second. And I was carrying a ladder because I was hanging up like confetti is, you know, some, something. And he said, you know, Benny, you should be a promoter. And I was like, really? I should be a promoter? Why? You know, like I had no idea what promoter even did. And so I, I started to, to, uh, you know, try things out and with the help and guidance of people like Rob, um, you know, we built dance here now, which was a big Thursday party in the city for a couple of years there. And we booked everybody from like anybody, you know, from like Carl Cox to, you know, and gave a lot of people their firsts too, you know? Um, so that was a, a, a really good experience. And, and, and Rob, you know, really was instrumental and, and as well as Nicholas Matar, who actually really gave me the keys to his clubs and was like, do, you know, if it wasn't for their generosity, I would not be where I'm at, you know, sure. those, those two guys and Nicholas and me are still really good friends. And he was, he wasn't easy. He was very, very uh, specific about how he wanted things. He was rough at times, but he taught me a lot. Rob was sometimes horrible to me, you know, to the point where he would would want to make me cry sometimes. But I learned. The biggest lessons I learned about events, I learned with Rob. You know, a lot of people, you know, I learned from Rob. You have to have a contract. You don't have a contract. You don't have anything. You don't have anything on paper that's signed by both parties. You don't have anything. You know, it's valuable lessons that I learned that, you know, I wasn't, you know, the experience is what I've gotten over all these years. Um, and I've, we've made together, we've, you know, grown a lot of artists as well. You know, um, what I will say is that I wish, you know, sometimes artists forget that the promoters have helped them. Oh, sure. Of course. You know. You know, there's artists that, that, you know, you give an artist a shot in New York City, you're giving them a shot and, you know, if they have substance, they're going to grow, right? Um, there's a lot of artists, and I'm not going to name names, obviously, because, you know, that will be scandalous. But, you know, there's a lot of people that forget. They forget. They think they did it on their own, you know, and, you know, there's many artists that, you know, now we're charging good cover fees, good ticket prices, but they weren't always there making that kind of money in New York. The promoters, we got them there. Yeah. Now they're charging these fees and these prices because we got them to that but then we don't get credit. Well, because you guys are behind the scenes. You know, not taking anything away from the talent. The talent is the talent. Either you got it or you don't. But I think sometimes, because, and it's also the way that the business is now too, people forget. People forget. There's people that don't forget. And then I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, I'll give you an example. This one, it's a good example, so I can say it. Like the Martinez brothers, biggest act in the world, right? One of the biggest. They always remember, always, always say, you know, let's give Benny a shot. 
They don't have to. Those are the, they're the most sought after, you know, one of the most sought after acts in the world. But they do because they re- they remember. So they're, they're kind to me, you know? And that is such a nice thing, you know? Um, you know, other people that I work, you know, I do a lot of also, I just don't stay in like soulful house music. I do a lot of techno, a lot of other types of sounds. Because I needed to do that. Like a lot of people would say, oh, like we can't have music. Well, you know what? I want to stay plugged into younger people as a promoter, right? I can't depend on the 50, 60, 70 year olds that, you know, they had their moment at the garage, right? There's a new generation. They don't want to hear about the garage. They'll read about it. Some of them do, but they have their own garage moment, whatever that is. And we know that it's not that good. We were there, you know, but it's their moment. Who am I to judge their music? Their, you know, their, but what's interesting that's happening now with young people is that if they become interested in electronic music, then they start digging and going back. And then they uncover people like, you know, Larry LeVan, you know, uh, you know, Francois K, Lenny Fontana, you know, and all of us, right? They find us eventually if you dig. They do. They come and send you private messages too. They're like, is that you? And young people, youth wins. I don't, you know, I, I don't like to, there's certain types of electronic music that I can't do. I don't like that EDM kind of stuff too much. You know, um, I like, a little bit of techno. Sometimes I like, I get into a dark mood, you know, and I like that, you know, um, for me personally, um, you know, I like the classics. I like a good house tune. I don't like, I don't just cannot stay stuck in the classics. I can't, I just can't. Anymore, you can. you know? <laughs> yes, you, know? you can. No, I, <laughs> nah. no, I don't. We know that. But, if, but what I find exciting is when a young person finds out finds a classic. Like recently, I heard some kids playing. Um, what was the, um, uh, it'll come to me. Um, White Horse. What was it called? Uh, Way back, if you Way back. Back. yes, young people playing that. The White Horse. I know it's crazy when you hear young people like. And I heard them playing it, and I was just like... Yeah, and you have to watch to see how they're going to react, right? I'm like, that fucking record is old, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But... It's older than you. A lot older than you that was playing it. I right? don't say a lot of stuff, too, because young people don't appreciate that either. They want to discover shit. They want to feel like they're in it. You know? Um, I'm really super lucky to be as old as I am and still be doing what I'm doing and dealing with young people, you know, which is like, um, and understand them. Yeah. That's the thing you understand. It. You, you, you can share some of it. You're not young anymore and you're not really old and it's not to put any one of us down, but you are able to speak their language and understand what they're feeling. To a certain extent, yeah, I tell you, and I appreciate some of the music. Listen, yeah. you know, there's so much good talent out there right now. You know, I mean, there. I just hear these young DJs right now that are crushing. That a lot of people in our scene don't know, but these kids are crushing. They're great, you know. So I support them. I'm I'm for giving a local, you know, like. You know these kids' muscle cars? Fierce. I heard them. I heard them with Christina. We were one night we went to um LeBain. I heard them. And Kenny Carpenter played with them. I was like, wow. Muscle cars. And, you know, love, love. Songs, and I was like sitting there going, Who are they? Love injection, those two yeah. kids, you know, Barbie and Paulie. They're fierce. But very kids. good too. I speak to them. Very good people. And they love the old school stuff. Yes. You know, that other kid that I think Louis Vega did a mix for him, Toribio? Yep. 
also young Brooklyn, you know, it's like, you know, there's, there's, you know, all the local, I play with this kid. Um, I didn't, you know, I played an, uh, an after hours. I got home at eight o'clock in the morning. So I played an after hours and I played hard. You know, This kid played after me, Omari Arias. He was so good. I was just like, wow. You know, and they play vinyl too. They're not scared to play vinyl. They play it and they play it really well. There's a lot going on in Brooklyn, right? And it's exciting. It's like sometimes I look at the lineups at like elsewhere and like at, at, at uh, nowadays. And I don't know a lot of those people. But I do know some, like, you know, those the two girls. Uh, I'm so proud of them, too. I don't see them and I don't hear them ever. But uh, Analog Soul, the sisters, mm-hmm. they're crushing, too, you know. It's such a, such a, uh, 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 and then there, you know, I have my favorites, my old school favorites. You know, I saw a list recently and I didn't like it. It was a list that was being passed around with, on the other, on the other side, it was old school DJs and their ages. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And, and to me, it was funny for a second, but I didn't like it. Because I felt like it's 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 discriminating against older people too, you know. It's like well, you know what it is. It's just showing. It's just showing that how we're still a lot of us are still in the game doing it and doing it good, really good. I look at it as like positive. I look at it as a positive. No, this to me the way that that I saw it and who the person who sent it to me sent it to me in a funny way. Oh, the a oh sorry. The AARP DJ list. Yeah. It was sent to me in a sh- in a way, you know, shady. You know? Very shady. But, but you know what? I gotta say, I gotta tell you this. Say it. I don't know many young DJs that can do, for example, when Danny Teneglia plays a stereo set, stereo Montreal. And that fucking bitch plays 18 hours. I know. I don't know many people that could do it any age. And I'm going to tell you, yes, yes. And he's 62. Going strong. I talk, We talked about him and I talked about that too. I'm like. 18 hours. And he takes you on a journey that you're just like. David Morales the other night on the boat. I, I was in awe. I was like, wow, you know. You know, Louis Vega, one of the hardest working people. Think about Louis. Louis works so hard. Harder than most young people that I know. You know, so it, to me, the age thing, I understand there's a new generation coming up. They want theirs as well, you know. Um, Carl Cox. Carl Cox. You know, I, I went to his night. In, in Ibiza, I went no, to... No, he's supposed to go 13 hours. He doesn't, you know, it's like, wow. And he's playing at DC 10. And you know what? The sound wasn't that, that as good as probably he would like it. You know, um, he's building something. Carl doesn't have to play that. He's doing it because he loves it and he wants to play it. Yeah. You know, like my, my friend Victor Calderon opened up. There's another person that, that, you know, has been playing for a long time that, that, you know, does he doesn't have to play anymore. Victor is set in his life. He doesn't have to play, you know, but he plays because he loves it. You know, so you know, a lot of these these legends, um, I see it both ways. You know, you have to pave the way for the young people, educate them, show them, you know, um, as far as they want to be shown. You know, you can't shove you know, you can't shove anything down anybody's throat. People don't like that either. Um, which is why I don't really talk about my past that much. Because, you know, maybe they don't want to hear it. You know, I don't want to talk about the glory days so much because they have their own glory days. You know, it's like, who am I to poo-poo their, their, their experience? So, you know, um, I know I've been all over the place. With no, stuff. but here's the thing. I'm going to tell you. This is the thing that's important. They have their heroes. We have our heroes. Yes, absolutely. Don't rain on their parade, I've always said. Appreciate what they're doing. And you don't have to be, 
you know, you could do it from, I always say from afar, you don't have to be in their face, but appreciate it. And maybe you can also expungiate something from it. Oh my God. I just looked at the comments because I clicked on comments. Oh, there's people are going nuts talking to you and I'm not stopping. And you know what? I didn't say anything because I didn't click on the comments. It was on the private. No, no, no you're not. I, I'm not having you. I, I don't, I don't. Hello, everybody. Now we're on the comments. I wanted him to talk. I didn't want to stop the comments and have everybody. There's a lot of comments. And I know, like, I just saw one from Bex. Yes, Bex. I know. Prehouse. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Yes, you know, like, but that's not what you were saying. That's it was, what it, it was a, there's a lot of stuff that that but but you know I, I have a lot of respect for for anybody that's like you have to look at people like Francois, Danny Crivet, Louis, Dave Morales, Carl Cox, Danny Tanek, Vic, even Victor, who's a little younger than them. But you have to look at all those people. Right? DJing is so accessible now, right? You can be a DJ if you if you have a program. Um, the difference is the way that I see it is that, and I I know I missed. I want to mention Ted Patterson too because me and Ted are so good, such good friends now too. I love Ted. That's a great person. He's a do- I, we all He's love. A, him. I love Ted, but but, and I'm sure I forgot to say. You know, I love so many of the new ones. Joseph Capriati. Nicole Mudaber, you know, the Martinez brothers, you know, so many that, that, that I, and locals too. Pablo Romero is awesome DJ. Um, and I know I'm missing, and Fisa, who, you know, me and Mike, and I want to say something about Mike too, but what I want to say about a lot of those older DJs is they've devoted their whole life to this. Not a year, not two years, not a decade, decades. You know, we're talking 30, 40 years plus. You know, somebody like any of those DJs I just mentioned can go back into their mind and pull a record out that's nobody remembers and make it relevant. And that's the mastery, right? To me, when a DJ walks into the DJ booth and changes the mood of the room, those are, there are not that many guys that can do that. You know, we live in an, you know, there's what I call manufactured superstars now. Isn't that an act too? But, but, you know, if you have a little money, you can, you know, boost your IG you know, your Instagram, if you have a team, right, you can create an act, you know, but, but things are different. You know, I don't know if we're going to see people with 30 or 40 year careers in the future. I don't, because it's just not set up that way anymore. It's not even that these people are not going into it for the same reasons that we all went into it. Correct. That's the difference. You have to realize that there's a different mentality thought process and an adornment love to the attention of being it wasn't just about being a star it was about making people happy no, they didn't want to even be seen no if if larry could have a shade and really pull the shade no he would give you that kind of shade the the people you know we we're in a different we're, we're it's just a different time and and I think that if you're if you're lucky enough, how dare, enough how dare they ring you when we're busy? That was my brother. I know. It's a, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and if if you know if we're if you've been blessed enough to experience those that time, um, I think you're lucky because. You know, like, listen, I DJ now. I don't consider myself a DJ. I get asked to play. So what I do is when I play, I play what I like to play. I play what I like to hear. I play the records that I want to hear it on, right? The, the, when I'm in my car. So what I do is I do what I enjoy. I don't consider my, you know, like, I don't consider myself a DJ because 
I kind of feel like there's other people that can do it so much better. I'm doing it because I want to do it and because it's fun. And I am tickled to death when somebody gives me $200 to play. Like for me, they could give me, I remember the first time I played, and they paid me like $150 and I was just, I could not stop smiling <laughs> because I was just like, geez, it's, it's like, so, you know, I don't get paid a lot of money to do it. I do it. That's why I'm picky too. I want to just do it when I want to do it. I don't want to do it all the time. Um, and if I do it, I want to do it the way I want to do it, you know? And I train wreck all the time. I do it all the time. Oh, you don't play with, I'm sorry, Betty, you don't play with the sync button? Sometimes I do. Oh, okay, everyone, he does play with the sync button. Sometimes I do. Sometimes if, if I'm having trouble, like, because I don't have an ear that, that's, I just, I have to learn. It's a, you know, it, it's not something I can't learn. It's, it do I time. have the time or the want to, right? It's time. So yeah. if, if there's something that I'm having trouble with, I'll, I'll tap the sync button real quick and it'll just get me there, you know? Um, but so two things about the sync button. One. Danny Crivet told me, don't worry about Danny. You does not use the sync button. No, I know that he mixes just like all of us do. And he said to me, don't worry about your mixing. Get to the point. He goes, if the, if you're making a point, and the point is well taken, that's what's important. The transition. They will, they will forgive you. The transition it happened, and we're on to the next record. Right. Danny Teneglia, on the other hand, okay. who, uses, who uses Tractor, yeah. and that's a sync situation, but he knows how to mix, obviously. Oh, right? shit. Yeah, Danny knows how to play. Right? He told me, he was like, bitch, you don't have time to learn how to mix. Use the <laughs> button. Put the sync button on and pay it no mind. Exactly. That's what he said, no. right? And pay it no, no mind. So, so what I've learned in the short time that I've been using, which is not actually not that short. I think I've been playing now on and off for close to 10 years. But what I've learned is it's really about the music. Like you can, because I, I know guys that are the best, I know guys that are flawless, 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 flawless mixers, but could not hold the dance floor. Oh, I know. They don't have an idea. They, they don't, they don't, they don't, um, they don't play the right records the right way. Right. So you can so make a class and if you don't program right. So I've learned, I've learned by watching mm -hmm. people like Dan, people like Louie, people like Danny Crivet, people like, Te you know, like, Gay, everybody. I, you know, I've gotten the best education that you can get for free, right? So I've learned, and and I enjoy it, and um, it's 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 um, and I've learned, and I'm gonna wrap it up because I know it's been going on for a long. That's time. all right. You you worried about it. you had enough to say. I was gonna say, bitch, you have plenty to say. Not not enough time. But before you wrap everything up, you said one thing I want to mention about Mike Weiss Nervous. Yeah, I wanted to bring him up too. That's who I wanted to talk but, to. Yeah, it's okay. So bring us there for Mike Nervous. He's, you know, Mike and me became partners on events. Another fate situation. Rob passed, and we had been doing events together, and me and Mike sort of organically became partners. We started doing events. Mike has a long history of, first of all, there's nobody, Mike is one of the hardest working people that I know. Mike is in the office often seven days a week at 10 a.m., the latest, till 8 p.m. Works hard. You know, um, you have to, if you want to make it in this game, nothing, you know, you have to, you have to work hard. We all do. You he's putting out 30 releases a month. You have to work hard. It's right. not easy now. 
Fair. He works. He works. He works. He works. And he DJs. And he's a promoter. And he wants to open up a club. When And I try to talk him out of it. I'm like, you're crazy. You don't have enough time. You're too old. He's like, Benny, I'm going to be working till I'm 90. I'm like, good luck. You know? But I'll say this. You know, nervous, no matter what anybody thinks about the music or whatever, one of the most important, because people have opinions, right? You know, people will say, nervous, defected, this label, that label, that's, you know, everybody has an opinion. But what I will say about nervous is this, it's one of the most important dance labels left in the world. If you look at its legacy and what it's done, and you look at, you know, how it was Mike built Nervous from scratch, his father, right, was Sam, right, Sam Records. And if you look at that whole thing, I mean, it's amazing what he's done and what he continues to do and how he really has his finger on what's happening uh, is pretty amazing, old and new, you know? And, and you know, it's, it's funny because when I first got involved with my, you know, you know, people, you know, people that own record labels from back in the day, everybody has a story. You know, people will talk about, you know, strictly people will talk about everybody has a story. No, oh, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the one thing about us, right. As you go older, grow older and you're still doing this, like we have, we all start to have stories about one another. <laughs> yes. True. Oh, that, I remember that bitch was shady back in the day. Oh yeah. Right. Oh, oh, yeah. oh she tried it or oh, this one got to watch out for her. And oh, don't make sure you read that contract, bitch. You know, like there's all of that. But you know what? If you're in the game long enough, somebody's going to say something about you that's negative or maybe it's true. The way it goes. It's the way of the game. It's you know, we all grew together. We all make mistakes. We all get mad. I can't tell you all the ones I'm mad at right now. That would be a whole other true house stories. All the, the the shit that I have for this DJ and that DJ. And don't she know, who she, look who she thinks she is now. You know, it's it's just this, this stuff that, you know, we grew together and that's it. It's just like a family, right? You don't get along with all your cousins. You don't, you know, your aunt that shows up. Family. <laughs> right. So, you, you, you know, this stuff. But Mike and me are very, 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 very direct with one another. There's no minced, there's no chopped, uh, minced words. Very direct. And I think that that's what makes us good partners. We don't, there's no, um, if there's something that makes me unhappy, I say it. And if there's something that makes him unhappy, he says it. Oh, that's and, cool. and we fight sometimes. I bet you do. He's not um, easy to deal with. I know that. He can be, he, he's. Oh, wait. <laughs> No, 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 no. You know what? I find him extremely easy. What I find is difficult about Mike. Mike, you listening? Is that he's doing too much, and sometimes I can always get Mike. Sometimes he cuts me off mid sentence if he's busy. He does. Um, Mike, you hearing this? Listen more. <laughs> but but Mike does a lot, and he can't talk to everybody. Yeah, that's the thing. And everybody's shooting promos at him. It's, you know, he's also an attorney. So people, you know, he's an entertainment lawyer. So people want legal advice. Advice. They want a record. They want a DJ slot. They want, there's only one. He doesn't have enough. To, and, 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 you know, no, I'm not nervous. You know, I'm his partner, but I'm not nervous records. But I get, because I'm Mike's partner, people think I'm nervous, which is fine. I don't mind being associated with such a legendary label, but no, I'm not nervous. I'm, I'm separate from that. So, um, but Mike is, uh, you know, a real sort of inspiration. He works really hard 
And I wish I could be more like Mike. Because Mike works. And the only thing that gets it done is work. Yeah. You know, I am, you know, not that I don't like to work, but I'm a lot more emotional about work than Mike. Mike is, you know why he's a good partner too? He's less emotional than I am. He's very cut and dry. I get really emotional. <laughs> and Mike, Mike, Mike pulls out the contract and that ends everything. Right. You know, so. He deals with it like a, an attorney deals with it without. without but that's good. She could. I'm more that's, of an art. I, I am more of an artist. That's like, what makes, but that's what makes a team a team work. You yeah. know, if you're both emotional, shit will be like shutting down all the time, yeah. right? And he yells at me sometimes. He says, you know, he tells me sometimes. He's like, that doesn't make sense. Or, you, you know, Benny, you're you're you know you're acting irrational or whatever he says, which a lot of times is true. You know, I can admit that I get very emotional sometimes, especially when I feel like like somebody doesn't respect me. That's my big thing. Because sometimes, you know, you will get, you know, DJs and people that are in the business that, that, you know, don't, you know, I've been doing this as long and sometimes longer than some of them. So, you know, I get a thing about that. And Mike always kinds of, he reels me back in and he's, a, he's great. You know, he knows my, my kid. I know his kids. Um, and he's just been, I'm lucky to have a partner like him, to be honest. With you. Not just saying that maybe because he's listening, you know, we both, we, we both bring something to the table. That's very different. And I think we understand that about each other and, and, um, and, you know, uh, appreciate that. And, and, you know, I want to say just to, to wrap it up because now I'm getting tired. Now, wait a second. I got to say to, to everybody, thank you for coming in. We got a whole, whole host of people that just came into this room. And oh, here. shit. Wait, can I look real quick? Before yeah, well, I... It's 157 now sitting down, getting ready to listen to you is, talk. Is that good or is that bad? It's excellent. On Twitch, it's excellent. Hello, everyone. Welcome to True House Stories. DJ Kevin, thank you for sending everyone our way. We are sitting with the legendary Benny Soto out of New York City, who's been telling us his life through this music industry from the beginning and also the shady part and the inside part. So we're great to have you all here. Oh thank you. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people. And people, people yes. And also if you're not following us, True House Stories, if you never experienced this before, True House Stories is a program that, airs every Wednesday or when we're on on the Wednesdays because we've took, taken a break during the summer to give people like Benny Soto who are our heroes in behind the scenes or possibly some of the big name DJs or artists that have come on and spoke about their lives in the music industry and how we've all coped or as in Quincy Jones would say it's not the peaks that you survive through, it's when you're in the valley. So the valleys are fierce, you know. Benny's photo is right here telling us all about his life. And he asked me to be very kind and polite when before we went on this this oh. this this journey together. And I'm gonna say this: he's actually been like a history teacher. He's given us some of his his experience do what he deals with on a day-to-day -day, looking back dealing with it then and coming forward to now explaining dj etiquette booth etiquette running a nightclub dealing with all the drama so i can't thank him enough and you know of course benny needs a secondary show of who let's call it the haters <laughs> that we would have to we would have to call because I'm going to tell you now, there's a thousand and one DJs that would want to work with Benny Soto. They'd probably, probably annoy him to death that he hasn't even mentioned about. And, you know, he even mentioned things that he said, hey, you know, Benny, why do you work with the same DJs? Well, we grew up together. I get that. I get that. And he's 
one of the few promoters that is part of an older school, but yet doing stuff now. You know, there's there's not many guys. Oh that, my God. People you, are talking about my train wrecks. <laughs> Benny and his train, Benny and his jet, Benny and the Jets. <laughs> but it's not about him DJing. We never looked at it like that. We knew you were doing it. Hey, you know what? If you enjoy playing music, look, Mancuso never mixed. He played record to record from rim to brim. And it wasn't about mixing for him. It was about the party. It was about training everyone, teaching them new music and whatever it was that he was feeling that night and he was expressing through music. And if you're doing that, Benny, in your crowd and you want to play the records that you like, train wreck or not, it doesn't make a difference. You know, you're doing it because you enjoy it. Oh, you know who I'm proud of too? Not because I want to associate them with, with train wrecks. <laughs> but you know who's really come a long way as an artist? They don't need my, my <laughs> affirmation. But I'm going to say it anyway. Um, that I'm very impressed with, Anani. Anani has really blossomed into her own, into her own thing. And and it's it's important, you know, to to say that because it, I think, it, yeah, a hundred percent. I think there's, you know, this is a male dominated game. Male dominated. And it's a, it's a business, it's a, it's a game that, you know, think about, I, I don't think people get enough credit. Like, I think that we don't give enough credit to, you know, there was the whole controversy with Beyonce, right? Mm -hmm. Releasing all that music, whatever. I think that it was great that she did it. I liked some of it and some of it I didn't care for. Um, <laughs> But what I do think that that's important is that we we take the time to really understand where it came from, right? And acknowledge that a lot of this was created by black gay men, right? People that went to church, but then carried at the garage on Saturdays and at the warehouse and there was the duality, right, between spirituality and God and a life of sin. Yes. At the same time, debauchery. Debauchery. That's how I see it. Yeah. It created, it, there's, there's, within that life and, and within the, the, the Black experience in America, there's a pain. There's a hurt. We hear it in the music. In the expression, right? House music is basically not all house, but a lot of house music in the traditional sense is gospel music with a beat. That's right. You know, so I think that, you know, now, you know, it's not even gay and lesbian anymore. It's like queer, right? There's a whole queer thing now which is great, more visibility, wonderful. Um, but I think that even within that scene, it's important for everyone to acknowledge that we would not have and we would not be where we are today if it wasn't for people like Frankie Knuckles. If it wasn't for people like Larry LeVan. You know, if it wasn't for the warehouse, if it wasn't for the garage, if it wasn't for Mancuso and the law, you know, um, and those things are complicated because, you know, um, first of all, we weren't keeping records back then like we are now. So there's the history has to be retold and it has to be retold accurately. There's a lot of people that claim the history that don't really know the history, right? That's true. Hello. Amen. And I don't, I, I just happen to live a smidge of the history. 
a little slice of my experience. That's my experience. And what I say is that all those people that went to the garage, that went to the warehouse, they, they paid with their lives for this. It's that, that deep for me. I can I have to agree. I have to agree with you. So they gave a lot. And, and it's important. Um, so when Beyonce comes in and, and, and you have to give it to her for her acknowledgement of it. But when you read stupid articles where people don't do their research that say, you know, like, oh, Beyonce saved house, you know, whatever. Or dance music is back. It's, that's just... Yeah, she, she, saved it. she saved it. <laughs> well, you know, she, it's written out of context, right? Because we've yeah. been we've been living house music or dance music, whatever you want to call it, for decades. We don't need Beyonce to come in and save us. But we do need that moment of visibility that she affords us, right? Mm -hmm. We can take advantage of that. So you know, we all have opinions. You know, I have a, my opinions about some of the stuff that was on the album. You know, um, but it's just my opinion. It doesn't really matter in this in the scheme of things. It's just how I feel. I'm only one person. Um, but I think it's important. It's important that that people that if people don't know that we talk about it and that we remember people like Larry. And remember people like Frankie and give it up for people like, you know, and I'm only using these people because they're fresh in my head, but people that have contributed, you know, um, you know, I'll use Ted Patterson as an example. You know, Ted Patterson was very instrumental in creating and adding to Winter Music Conference, which no longer really exists. It's now Miami Music Week. Mm -hmm. But that party that Ted did, right? Magic Sessions? Magic Sessions, yep. was a really keystone party. Oh, big. Cornerstone party big. of that whole thing, right? And there's people, people are standing on the shoulders of people that are standing on the shoulders of people that are standing on the shoulders of people. That's true. That wouldn't have gotten to where they're at. And I think that that's what's important, that we just acknowledge that. And I will say this, that if you want to be a promoter, be a promoter. You know, it's not that hard, but it's not that easy either. No, it's not easy at all. You got to work hard. And the biggest thing about it is that you have to stick to it. If you do two parties and they both, you know, I remember doing 718 sessions one time early when, when they were down at 66 Water Street. And I was still doing the party. It was with Richard Alvarez and uh, my son's mother, Kabira Rosado. And there was no, I remember we had a, a guest. All the money was paid out. Um, there was no money left. And me and Richard walked home because we had no money for a cab. So... That's how it started for me, you know, um, in giving out flyers and, and I stuck to it and I learned and, and, um, it's, it's, I'm very, I can't say how grateful I am. Um, I would love to do something else now. I have to say that. Okay. I can stand. Um, I and I have some ideas, but who knows if I'll get to them. All right. I always say I have one more act to follow. I have one more act before the curtain falls. Okay. So we'll see. Um, but, you know, I'm very, very grateful. Thank you, Lenny. Um, we love you. Asking we, we love you. I've asked you when, when I first started doing this show and you said, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. I'm glad you thought about you know, it. Yeah, I, I, I always do that because I feel like sometimes people take me out of context because of the way I express myself. I'm no. no. And, and I think sometimes people take me out of context. But um, I will say that um, I appreciate everybody who came on, everybody who listened. 
Um, a lot of people who keep watching this. Trust me to learn all your secrets, Miss Thing. <laughs> Remember, he is Charles. And Charles says this, there is no guest list tonight. There is no guest list. Wait, before I let you go, hang on, hang on. 